Malena. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'll share my screen once you guys, um, I think you have to stop sharing so I can start sharing. Oh my gosh, there's so many of you. Welcome. And I, it's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to get to, I feel like I'm in Boston right now. Women in Boston um, who are coding and also working in blockchain. Um, I'm not too far away. I'm in New York. Uh, and let me start sharing my screen. I'm going to share my full screen so that you guys can see everything. Perfect. And can you hear my audio okay? Great. So, um, thank you, Monsi and Indira, um, for inviting me to speak today about digital privacy. It's a topic that I'm passionate about, um, but only recently started uh, working in this space or thinking about this space. So the motivation behind the presentation today is to really make privacy a more accessible topic um, so that people can, can feel engaged and empowered to, to learn more about, um, about innovations in privacy, but also how to think about privacy in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, as Monty said, I am uh, work on product marketing at the Electric Coin Company, and we're the team behind Zcash. I'll talk a little bit more about Zcash later, but um, it's a privacy-preserving digital currency and, uh, and something for you to check out if, if you're curious about that. So I'm sure you've all felt this. Um, probably this is a reason that you signed up for, for the call today. Uh, there's definitely an evolution of the way that we're talking about privacy. Conversations about this topic are changing so fast as we find ourselves spending more and more of our lives online. And um, in, in our local communities, we're also seeing that citizens and governments are demanding more privacy protections as surveillance technology evolves. I have pictured here just a handful of headlines um, from different industries around the world talking or illustrating how uh, people are feeling the encroachment or the threat of uh, encroachment of surveillance technology, but also a threat to their privacy and security. And one of the things that makes this topic particularly hairy is that privacy is really hard to define. Uh, definitions for privacy vary from cultural context to a specific social circumstance, and even depending on the technology you're using or the environment that you're in. I think all of this contributes to making privacy, you know, capital P privacy, the, the topic, um, really intimidating and confusing. Uh, and I think at our core, at least intuitively, we all feel that to some degree, no matter how you define privacy, everybody deserves privacy. I hope that by the end of this talk, um, my, my hope is that by the end of this talk, you'll come away with two things. One is that there's different ways to think about privacy, and that's okay. Uh, and two, there are definitely tangible action items that you can take to be more mindful of digital privacy. And it doesn't require wearing a mask or, you know, downloading a tour relay. Um, these are things that <clears throat> you can do without changing a lot of your day-to-day -day habits. Um, I am a huge user of, of Google products and Facebook products, and, and I think it's a myth that we have to completely upend our lives just because we want a little bit more privacy. So I know I've said a few times privacy can be intimidating. I am curious um, to hear from the group and I think, let's see, if I stop sharing my screen for just a second, um, we're gonna experiment with a little interactive uh, portion. So I just wanna get to know you all a little bit better and um, using Zoom, if you look at your bottom control, you like where it says participants and chat, there's this little button that says reactions. So I'm gonna give myself a little reaction right now. 
Exactly. Joe, great. Indira, awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask a question. Exact, I love that everybody is puffing up with their, with their reactions. And Dul say it's so good to see you online. Um, so I'm going to ask a question and then ask you if you feel positively or um, however you want to answer the question to do so with your reaction or to um, add your thoughts in the chat. So the first question is, how knowledgeable do you feel about privacy? If you feel really, really knowledgeable, like you and Edward Snowden, or like, I think because we, can we can't do a scale, we can only do yes or no. So if you lean on the more knowledgeable side of the privacy spectrum, react with a thumbs up. If you feel less knowledgeable about privacy, react with a clap. Exactly, Destiny was already on. Okay, a lot of clappers, but blockchain girls, I love seeing that. Um, confidence never hurt anybody. So if you feel positive or, or empowered about privacy, um, you can definitely put a thumbs up there. And now I have a second question and it's, um, it's slightly different. It's a question that I wish we asked ourselves more often, but we don't. Uh, do you feel secure about your own digital privacy? Again, thumbs up if you feel super secure, no hacker is gonna bother you, you use privacy, password managers, um, and you feel great. Or clap if um, at some point in your life you have felt insecure about your own digital privacy, meaning that you feel you could be um, the victim of a hack or you feel that somebody could use your information against you. Lots of claps. So I think that's why talking about privacy is important. It's something that uh, subconsciously we probably just like eating right or exercising. I think it's something people want to be better at, but, um, but yeah, we need to talk about it more so we can learn what best practices to do. Okay, that is, oh, I had one more. Okay, humor me, one more question. Uh, clap if you've ever used a, um, Clap or, or high five, whatever, if you've ever used a privacy focused app. So something like Brave Browser, if you've ever used Signal, um, just put up a reaction if you've experimented, DuckDuckGo, excellent. VPNs count. Um, so yeah, if you've ever experimented with some of those, we'll be talking about those tools today. Okay, cool. I love that about half of the group has and half of the group hasn't. Firefox, Kind of counts, yeah, we, there are types of Firefox that count. Okay, so let's get back to sharing my screen um, so that we can get on with our presentation. Thank you in advance, or thank you for participating um, with those questions. So I have a few slides prepared. I um, definitely am excited to share my thoughts with you, but I also wanna invite you to share your thoughts in the chat um, to, to get, things going. One thing you can answer is what questions come to mind when you think about privacy and what areas specifically about digital privacy would you like to learn more about. I'll go through my presentation and then at the end um, we can have uh, go into a lot of those questions. So as I'm talking don't be shy. Feel free to to just share your thoughts and reactions into the chat. Okay, so as I mentioned, I work at Electric Coin Company. Um, I started there about six to seven months ago. But before I started working there, I actually uh, didn't have very much experience working in privacy tech at all. And I found that uh, it was actually really empowering or really helpful to learn about privacy from different perspectives. For example, I was um, really surprised to find that there's such a strong feminist perspective on the topic of digital privacy. I have three links here that um, I strongly recommend, and I also put together a Google Doc for with all of these resources linked in there. So um, the first talk is from Eva Galperin. She is a technologist and a privacy advocate and director of cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. She gave a talk about stalkerware, which is a type of software that's used by individuals to monitor their spouses. And uh, it just really made me think differently about how um, powerless some people are 
because they do not have the um, knowledge or the ability to control their digital privacy. If you want something a little bit lighter, a little bit more fun, I strongly recommend artist Aggie Wagonet, Addie Wagonet. Um, she has a series of OPSEC makeup tutorials on YouTube that are short, informative, and absolutely hilarious. For example, her Korean sheet mask and password management for poor refining wins um, is a video that absolutely changed the way that I uh, think about my passwords. And a lot of the advice that she gives in that short five minute video, I use day to day. And lastly, something that I was surprised by is um, how different words uh, carry the same meaning across, um, across different contexts. So for example, GDPR, it's a landmark privacy law um, in the European Union. Uh, the way that GDPR defines consent, digital consent, is actually very similar to the way that Planned Parenthood defines consent in their sex education literature. Another perspective I really like on privacy, and this is completely analog, it has nothing to do with tech, or um, at least with uh, digital privacy in the internet. And this is the historical perspective on privacy. So the reason I found um, these resources particularly helpful is because it goes to show that the conversations we're having today about surveillance, information, ownership, and power structures these conversations have been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, Dr. Lawrence Capello, he's a professor at the University of Alabama, and he charts the history of privacy through the US Constitution. So um, he starts at around 1890 all the way to today. And I really like these perspectives because um, it helps me think about how people solved the problems back then that we're still facing today. And I, I also like the picture featured here. It's of Estelle Griswold. She was the head of Planned Parenthood in Connecticut. Um, and this picture is after the landmark Supreme Court case, Griswold versus Connecticut, which established an individual's right to privacy. Let me, I have it written down. I, okay, yeah, I don't wanna get it wrong. An individual's right to privacy is a fundamental right that can't be infringed upon by the state. And the subject of this course case was actually um, giving Planned Parenthood the ability to sell birth control in the state of Connecticut. Um, also, the right to privacy is part of the United Nations uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that was established in 1948. So this is not a new topic. This is something that um, we've been thinking about for a long time, but of course, the advent of the internet and digital um, devices and tools and services that connect us all has really changed the way that um, we think about privacy. So I'm going to give like two broad categories for digital privacy um, and that'll help frame the way we talk about privacy for the rest of the presentation. The first category is information privacy. This is the idea that you should have control or ownership over any personal information or any information that's inherently yours. So that could mean your face, your genetic sequence, your fingerprints, uh, but it could also mean something like your social security number or what we call PII, personally identifiable information. Another type of digital privacy is communication privacy. So this is the idea that your digital communications and messages should be secure and free from unwanted surveillance or censorship. Um, this is like when you hear about things like Zoom bombing or end-to-end um, -end encryption on WhatsApp versus Signal uh, versus another messaging app. Um, this is the idea that uh, a third party or an intermediary, a service provider, shouldn't be able to intercept your messages because the service they're providing you you're assuming is secure and free from that type of interception. And I've added in red links to these different examples uh, so you can check out how these debates around privacy are happening um, every day. And then there's also a third type of digital privacy, one that I know Monsi and I think about all the time, 
anybody who um, is working in crypto, this is one of the hottest topics in, in cryptocurrency, and it's the idea of financial privacy. Similar to communication privacy, the idea of digital financial privacy is the, um, no, the idea of financial privacy is the idea that your digital financial transactions should be secure and free from unwanted surveillance or censorship, much like physical cash is secure and free from unwanted surveillance and censorship. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about how financial privacy is relevant to crypto. Um, and oh, one thing I wanted to touch on. So this is a central idea for people who work in fintech or people who are working in digital currencies. Um, and it's the idea that, you know, what is the promise that you're making to your customer when you're providing this um, financial service that has to do with money or some representation of money online. Um, the promise of financial privacy kind of implies or indicates that intermediaries that we all rely on, like banks, credit cards, and payment processors, they shouldn't be able to share or sell your financial data, uh, at least without your consent. And furthermore, they also shouldn't be able to censor otherwise perfectly legal activity. So um, the first part, sharing and selling your financial data, uh, the verdict is actually still out on this. This up until like 1997, I don't think there was a law saying that financial service providers um, can't share your digital information um, or your financial information. So, so that debate is still being discussed, I think more than people realize. Uh, and then the second part, uh, financial censorship or financial exclusion is absolutely something that happens um, more and more as a lot of our um, services are going online. So two examples of this, one is sex workers um, who are doing you know, perfectly legal and consensual activity or, or um, work online uh, often get excluded from financial services providers because they're seen as high risk customers or high risk clients. Uh, and similarly, in a lot of cities, at least in the East Coast, uh, there was a movement to do from QSR or quick service restaurants to do cashless um, processing. Uh, so you could go to Sweet Green or Dos Toros and you wouldn't have to pay with, um, you, you couldn't pay with physical cash. That, that uh, practice was seen as financially discriminatory because it excludes people who, who are unbanked or who don't have access to finan traditional financial services. So this is kind of uh, two examples of why financial privacy is particularly important and a subject that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Okay, so now I'm ready to go into privacy and crypto. Um, so I know about half the group is women in code and another half of the group is women in blockchain. For the women in blockchain, I hope that this um, isn't entirely redundant, but um, I think it is, is always good to just get a refresher on this topic. So for those of you who don't know, most cryptocurrencies expose your entire payment history to the public. That includes sender, the receiver, and the transaction amount. All of that is visible to anyone um, by using a simple blockchain explorer tool. So um, this is kind of like the industry standard or, or the most normal um, situation or circumstance in crypto is most cryptocurrencies tend to be public. Uh, and now there are different approaches um, that are happening today to try to achieve more privacy preservation in crypto, both at the protocol level and at the application level. Protocol level, you should think about as kind of like the operating, um, the operating system level, and then applications are of course the tools and services and devices built on top of that. In the image I have here, um, this is just to illustrate what I mean by the sender receiver and transaction being visible. Um, so I have the person on the left and the person on the right. You can see their faces. That is meant to represent you can see their identity um, or that's public. 
And then um, the little papers above their head, that's the content of the transactions. So I'm gonna talk about three different approaches to privacy in crypto, um, but there are certainly way more than three. These are just kind of the three most common ones. One of the exciting things about cryptocurrencies is that it really is a space with uh, dramatic and uh, like a Cambrian explosion of um, technical innovations, particularly in the form of um, theoretical research, applied cryptography, and, and just really pushing to the bleeding edge what is possible. So I'll talk about these three different um, approaches to privacy, at least in this industry. The first is ZK SNARKS, um, and I'm going to read, I always get this acronym like a little bit off, so I'm gonna read what it stands for. So ZK SNARKS stands for Zero Knowledge, Succinct, Non-Interactive Argument of Knowledge. All of that is to say it's a really long and complicated way of expressing a pretty straightforward idea, which is basically a ZK snark is a mathematical proof that can verify that a statement is true without actually revealing any information about the underlying statement. ZK snarks are most commonly associated with Zcash. Zcash is the currency um, that I work on the most. So with Zcash, what you can do is send a shielded transaction, a specific type of private transaction that's available on our network. And um, using a shielded transaction, you can obfuscate or hide the identity of the sender, of the receiver, and the content of the message. Um, so this is the first approach to privacy. There is another uh, approach to privacy that's called ring signatures or ring CT. Uh, the CT stands for confidential transactions. And this privacy or anonymization strategy is most commonly associated with Monero, which is another really popular uh, privacy focused cryptocurrency. For ring signatures, uh, this anonymization strategy is where each transaction has multiple signers to obfuscate the identity of the sender. So let's assume our sender is the um, blonde woman pictured here. There, if she's gonna send a transaction, just like if she were to send a check, uh, three more people would sign into the transaction in order to obfuscate um, from an observer on the network to tie her specific identity to, um, to the receiver on the other end. And then the last example I'll talk about is something called coin join. CoinJoin is an anonymization strategy similar in theory to um, ring signatures. It essentially combines several Bitcoin payments in order to make it harder to con connect different senders and different receivers. Okay. Oh, and this one is uh, very commonly associated with a product called Wasabi Wallet. So CoinJoin has applications at a protocol level, but um, the one that's most popular, most commonly used is with Wasabi Wallet, which is an application uh, layer approach to privacy. So Wasabi Wallet lets you use Bitcoin more privately in theory by letting you do these type of transactions, uh, which are called multi-signature or multi-sig transactions. Okay, that was a lot. I know that was like, more technical um, content, and I, I know it happened all at once. So I'm going to check the chat to see if you're still with me. I also think we're about halfway through the presentation. Um, and oh gosh, great question from Azimahal. Does privacy still exist? I love thinking about privacy because it gets very meta and existential really quickly. Um, so let's definitely talk about that in the Q and A. Um, Okay, Caroline worked in InfoSec before she got interested in blockchain. And I wanna go back to, okay, excellent. So is there something that can skim privacy policies? So, oh, okay, that's Destiny Mulqueen asks, is there something that can skim privacy policies and terms and conditions so that I know what I'm agreeing to without having to read the whole thing? There are absolutely tools that do this and I'll talk about that in the, um, later in the presentation when we talk about tangible actions. So uh, zero knowledge, yes, okay, Roy, you found a typo. That was an Easter egg. I put it in there just to make sure you guys were awake and look at you, you were. 
So thank you for finding that typo. Um, and yes, ZK snarks um, do not reveal information about the uh, the senders, receivers, or give you the ability to send transactions without uh, revealing information. So what a what a good catch. Okay. Um, let me give a quick recap of what we've talked about and then we'll move on to the next section. We talked about different ways to think about privacy from perspectives like feminist perspective or historical perspective. We talked about three broad categories or three broad types of digital privacy. One is information privacy. So that's um, if you hear people getting concerned about facial recognition or surveillance technology, um, aggregating content or aggregating my personal information to create a, you know, a digital avatar, a digital identity of me that they can then use to target ads towards me. A lot of that type of focus is um, under the broad category of information privacy. Then we talked about communication privacy. That's where a lot of the um, ideas around end-to-end -end encryption are or government. Um, surveilling on or even Facebook surveilling on my personal uh, email or my private messages to my family. And then the last one we talked about was financial privacy, where we dove a little bit deeper and covered financial privacy as it applies to crypto. We talked about three different types of cryptocurrency privacy approaches. All right, now I think we can move to the next topic and talk about tangible actions you can take to um, be more mindful of your privacy and digital lives online. So this picture here I find so soothing and calming. It reminds me of a life before quarantine, um, working at a coffee shop. That's certainly something that I did all the time. Uh, and I think it's really great to think about privacy in a real context like this. So this is what I would do day in and day out. It's what I'll probably do um, in the future. And whatever privacy solutions that work for me should work within this context. So let's think about this picture a little bit more. We'll name the, the young lady in the picture Bonnie. And we'll think about what can Bonnie do? Um, what small steps can she take to just be a little bit more mindful of privacy? So for those of you who raised your hand about if you've experimented with these um, different privacy focused services before, I'd love for you to share in the chat what your reactions were, positive, negative, neutral. Did you love these services? Did you find that they were clunky and not as good to the, um, the more mainstream alternative or the, the main, mainstream um, products and services? One of the things that I find um, can be really intimidating about experimenting or exploring privacy tools is the feeling that you have to do everything all at once. Um, and something that's worked really well for me is to just take these tools one step at a time and in a very um, time boxed way. So when I'm generally trying to decide if I want to explore or learn more about a privacy tool, I give myself a week. I experiment with it for a week, and then afterwards I reflect on if I liked the product, what didn't I like about it, how is it better or worse than, um, than the mainstream um, product, and then I decide if I want to keep it or not. So using that process, it allowed me to, I've switched over to Brave browser as opposed to Chrome. Um, that's actually how I trained myself to use a password manager. I was like normally really um, inconsistent with that. Uh, but it also, you don't have to um, make the switch if it's not convenient for your lifestyle. For something like a search engine, I have found it really hard to make the switch away from Google just because having my um, search history connected across all of my devices is really, really convenient when I'm trying to look up that one restaurant that my friend told me about or try to find the phone number for the dog walker in my mom's neighborhood or, you know, something like that. So these are just a handful of examples. One thing that I want to leave you with, um, if you get nothing else out of this presentation, and I should have made people do this in the reaction part, it's please use a password manager. 
This is one of the simplest ways that you can make a radical impact on your digital security. If you reuse passwords or if you use weak passwords, um, it just sets, doesn't set you up for success in terms of long-term digital security. So um, we can talk in the Q&A about different password managers and how they work, but uh, I strongly recommend just challenge yourself in quarantine to try to use a password manager. Give yourself a week to play with it. Um, okay, and then final thoughts. Privacy and security, it's like eating right or exercising. Small changes in behavior can have a big impact over time. If any of the links I mentioned to you or any of the broad topics um, around privacy advocacy or resources were interesting, these are some of the resources that I really, really love. Uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation does such a good job with um, explainers. They have little onboarding resources for, you know, how to make the switch or how to onboard into different um, privacy focused uh, tech stacks. Uh, Mozilla Foundation and privacytools.io are also tool tools um, to resources that I love a lot. So now I'll check into the chat. I always like to have a backup plan. So in case people didn't have any questions, I populated four kind of like backup questions just in case. Um, so let me go into the chat and then I'm happy to stop sharing my screen um, if we wanna make it more uh, interactive. Okay, so I'm just trying to scroll. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm scrolling through the chat. I'm sure you all were reading this as I was talking, but just to get myself caught up, um, Roy says on top of a password manager, use a password algorithm. That is like for extra credit. I certainly uh, didn't even know that that was something you could do. That's like going the extra mile. But if you're not using a password manager, that is you know, something that your dad could set up or your grandparents could set up. Like it's a, there's so many tools out there right now and they're typically very user-friendly. Um, Dulce recommends Keybase for communication and uh, I've enjoyed using Keybase for communication as well. I think the trick is that um, for a lot of the communication and social media platforms, all of your other friends have to be on it. So everyone's been in, in that environment where you um, get asked a question like, oh, or get invited to a different platform and you're like, oh man, I have to download another app. So that's the main pain point I have seen with privacy focused messaging tools. Um, I'm gonna, so uh, somebody had asked the question earlier, is there something that can read all of the terms and conditions for me? Um, there is, there's an app called Jumbo um, and they charge $3 a month to do this for you. But a lot of people kind of, this has created like a very interesting discussion in whether or not you should charge for something that should be a right. So if you look at something like TurboTax, they charge you for a service that you would normally do for free, but they make it so easy and they take away all the headache. Um, you could make an argument that like, instead of charging for the service, the United States government or whatever tax body should actually just make the process of tax fulfillment easier as opposed to keeping it really hard and then having service providers charge on top of that. Um, because that creates a disparity between those who can afford to pay for TurboTax and those who can. And there's a similar argument to be made for privacy as a service, which is what um, apps like Jumbo do. So we have a couple more questions in the chat. Oh, that is a formula that dynamically creates your password. Yes, so some, the, um, sorry, I'm catching up. Roy was mentioning for a password algorithm, a uh, password algorithm dynamically creates your password. For example, if you use one password, um, they have a generator, like a password generator. And I think it, it acts like very similarly to that. Um, Oh no, he's, yeah, he's not referring to that. Okay, it's kind of like a little rule-based formula to help you remember your passwords. Um, okay, mm, nice. So that's all I have. I wanna thank you all for like the really active chat. 
um, can stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to go into these questions or just kind of unmute everybody and um, and open the conversation to maybe we can throw it back to the original question. Does privacy exist anymore? Um, I think it does, but I think that uh, it's something that we have to be really mindful of because if we don't think about privacy daily, we're going to accidentally build a world without it because the financial incentives for harvesting and selling aggregated data is, is very, very strong. And so it, in order to combat a financial incentive like that, uh, we as customers and we as citizens have to be really thoughtful and very vocal um, about the privacy protections that we want embedded in our products. Um, cool. So thank you all for having me. And um, Mansi, I don't know if we should unmute people or, or how you want to handle the Q&A portion. Sure. Um, I was hoping if everyone posts their questions on chat, we can go through them one by one. So uh, while Elena DeWine talking a little bit about VPN and while she does that, um, everyone can start typing in their questions in the chat box. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about um, VPNs. So, and now that we're not sharing screen, um, let's use a uh, show of hands. Who here has used a VPN or knows what a VPN is? Um, and do like either of the reactions. Okay, cool. So VPNs are interesting. I think when I first started working in crypto, the the um, the a la mode, like the 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 phrase of the of the day was like, oh, you got to download a VPN if you're working from a coffee shop. You have to do that. That's so important, like privacy 101. Um, and then I. I read up a little bit more about it. So for, for those of you who don't know, a VPN is virtual private network. And essentially it lets you, um, when you're in a public space, um, kind of hide or, or represent your IP address as something else. So if somebody wants to target you or hack you, um, in theory, you're making it harder because your VPN is like somewhere in France or somewhere else. VPNs are also used if you want to circumvent firewalls. So if you are in Venezuela and you want to access a service that blocks Venezuelan IPs, um, you can download a VPN and typically that's a kind of a 101 way to, um, to access services that you would otherwise be blocked from. from but I think it's been kind of used as a silver bullet. Like if I'm using a VPN, therefore I like I can do whatever I want and everything will be private. Um, and this is from privacytools.io. I thought they did a good job explaining it. Um, a VPN will not keep your browsing habits anonymous, nor does it add security to otherwise like unencrypted traffic. So if you're on an HTTP not an HTTP website, a VPN isn't going to give you magically more security. Um, you still definitely want to be on an uh, HTTPS website. If you're looking for anonymity, um, there are anonymity focused browsers like Tor um, that can probably be like a little bit more effective at achieving your anonymity goals. Um, and if you're looking for Oh, okay, so they say specifically like the use case for VPNs. If you're looking for additional privacy from your ISP on a Wi-Fi network or specifically like for torrenting files or accessing um, a service that your ISP that blocks your ISP maybe for geographic reasons, then a VPN is a is a good service or would be a good way to go. But uh, you shouldn't think of it as kind of like a silver bullet or a magical invisibility cloak that gives you just a bunch of privacy because um, that's not actually what it does. Okay, I think we have one question in the chat. 
So, oh, we could talk about contact tracing. I see. So this quarantine will not end anytime soon. COVID immunity becomes the gold standard to enter the mainstream workforce. Um, individuals will gladly provide authorities with access to their health records. This is such a good question. Who, who threw it in there? Ro uh, Doug, thank you. Um, okay, individuals will gladly provide authorities access to their health records related to C-19 exposure. Um, will COVID forever change the way we view about privacy? So this is a fascinating question and it's not just um, exposing kind of like your COVID individual background uh, to get back into the workforce. There's also a lot of movement around COVID to um, show your phone data or your geo-targeting data or your social data so that you can do something called contact tracing. So if, if I got sick um, in Singapore, for example, there are contact tracing uh, services or devices that would allow um, um, to create a map to see who have I been in contact with and who else might also be infected with COVID. So um, yes, Roy, privacy and anonymity are somewhat different. I'm sorry if I just accidentally used them interchangeably. Um, but on the topic of will COVID change the way we think about privacy, I think it certainly has that potential and it seems to be going in that direction. If we think about how something like 9-11 in the United States led to the Patriot Act, which led to a lot of encroachments on um, individual privacy and mass surveillance programs in the name of security, uh, it's certainly reasonable to see how something like that could happen again. Uh, and it's not just COVID, I think there's also a lot of arguments that are being made in the United States and in other countries um, to fight against end-to-end -end encryption in the name of combating terrorism, combating child pornography, combating other things. And um, it's kind of like a false choice. You shouldn't really have to um, eliminate something as powerful and as helpful and useful as end-to-end -end encryption in the name of catching the bad guys. Um, a lot of those conversations fall into backdoor, like backdoor technology. So should um, technology providers be forced to build in a backdoor? Um, so if governments want to surveil or, or if there's suspicious activity, they can go in and, and uh, decrypt or unencrypt information on a specific device. Um, so, so I think those conversations are definitely accelerated under a um, high pressure or tense situation like COVID. Oh, and even like a lot of the privacy advocates that I follow, there's um, a reporter for the New York Times, uh, Charlie Wurzel, who is a staunch privacy, um, at least in his reporting, advocates very strongly for privacy and yet he came out the other week saying, you know, I'm for contract tracing and um, allowing government more um, jurisdiction or more purview over my personal digital information in the name of um, public health or public security. Um, so people are making a lot of good comments in the chat. Um, Oh man, and Caroline is bringing up uh, India, which is a fascinating case study in privacy, something I can talk about a little bit more. So the question that Monty posed to the group are what, have, what are some of your biggest concerns around privacy? Um, and then I'll read comments from Roy and Caroline and kind of talk to them a little bit. I'm also happy to, um, I think we can kind of unmute people if, if people feel like we can have a conversation, maybe just raise your hand if you want to talk. I don't know if that will get too unruly too quickly, um, but I certainly think uh, hearing perspectives from other people would be um, helpful. So Roy makes the point that privacy and anonymity 
are not the same thing. And people sometimes believe that because I am anonymous, therefore um, I have complete privacy. Um, and, and it is a very nuanced uh, discussion. So anonymity is a, is a condition or it's a type of um, broad privacies, but there's also something like confidentiality or selective disclosure. Um, these are different technical definitions or they can be technical definitions for, for, for privacy. So if I'm using an app, what are my expectations, uh, my privacy expectations for what I'm gonna get out of it? Do I expect the app to be end-to-end -end encrypted or am I okay with a certain level of encryption guarantee, but I also want that service provider to be able to, you know, help me reset my password or help me recover my lost messages. Um, or in Zoom, help me share recordings uh, with a broader audience. All of that is made possible um, or made easier because of their encryption schemes. So Caroline brought up um, India. And there's a good article about the state of India a state in India that has to do with curbing the spread of the virus, much more advocacy um, in the app dev space needed. So India is a fascinating case study. I think long before COVID, India, I say long before, let's just say like months before. Um, and I'm also looking at the time. So maybe we'll take like two more questions and then Monsi, I'll throw it back to you for wrapping up. Um, or no, I think, how late does this go until? So it's kind of flexible after the okay. presentation. So if you want to hang out, chat, make it more interactive, we can do that. I'm happy if people want to raise their hands, I'm happy to unmute them. And if they want to say something, um, I'm happy to do that. I don't want to unmute all at once because that kind of gets messy. So Mayhem. just raise your hand or put a comment um, and I'll unmute you on my end. Great. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit um, about the case in, in India for people who might not be aware. Um, so earlier this year, we should say, India um, had, or the government in India had put forward kind of like some preliminary bills or some preliminary proposals on a widespread privacy law similar to GDPR. Um, and it was kind of touted as like the most stringent privacy law on the planet. And what would make it really cool is that since India is such a populous country, it would be widespread privacy protections for just a much bigger um, part of the world than compared to a place like Europe. And I think one of the things that I found fascinating about this is that um, the law was very strict on privacy for corporations, and yet it included a huge, very vague backdoor for the Indian government. Um, and it opened up like quite a lot of um, concerns from privacy advocates, but because our global, global news or global information tends to be very Western centric, I don't believe that this story has been getting as much attention as it as it deserves. And then Caroline, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but um, the uh, prime minister, the head of the Indian government, Modi, I believe is his name, Modi, and it starts with an N afterwards, um, recently endorsed an, a COVID contact tracing app um, that was completely insecure or had a lot of privacy concerns um, and the app, like once you downloaded it on your phone, was, was quite invasive in terms of the information that it would collect and store um, and then share uh, back to a central server. So read, if, if you're interested in privacy, like definitely read up more about what's going outside, what's going on outside of the United States. Um, because I think we tend to be very focused on what's going on in Europe what's going on in the US. And yet, let's say that the privacy law in India passed um, and it included this huge back door, what would be the implication for all of the offshore um, developer uh, workforce that all of those companies that build 
um, tools like outsource development tools uh, for companies here in the U.S.? Like, would they be subject to and their products and their um, would that be subject to the backdoor jurisdiction of the Indian government? Who knows? Um, okay. And I'll just read people's comments, but I see MS has their hand up. Um, and yeah, unmuted them. So, okay, cool. Hmm. not letting and mute oh well so i'll read um roy you're not a troll at all keep keep um sharing these really great comments roy says the google apple alliance sounds like a good i guess he's saying trick into getting people to reveal their location information and stuff like that um so uh people associated with zcash they're um, not at my company, but at a, a sister organization called the Zcash Foundation. They're part of, um, of a group of companies or a group of organizations that are working together to do anonymous contact tracing or facilitate anonymous contact tracing. And Roy, I'm happy to share the link or pop the link in that resource doc um, if you wanna learn more. The, the long story short is just, it's a lot harder to do things if you want to do it privately or if you want to do it in a way that protects and preserves people's information like you the the bar has been so low for so long in terms of um keeping our digital privacy and our our, our i shouldn't say privacy i'm using privacy and security interchangeably they are not if you are secure you can maintain your privacy if you have an insecure digital hygiene, then you're likely to, um, to have, uh, oh wait, I can't. Hey. No. Oh, okay. Yes. Roy's talking now. Hey, sorry. No, what I was saying about the Google Apple thing, there, there's been a number of articles that, uh, anonymity is all well and good until you get into scenarios, right? So, uh, all of a sudden you get a notification on your device that says fr from this Google Apple thing, you get a notification that says you cross paths. Uh, in the last two days or yesterday with someone who's COVID positive and uh, you cross paths with them here at this place. And that may seem all good and innocent. And, you know, I mean, uh, most of us would sign up for that knowledge, but uh, it exposes location to you. Like it shows. And so you, you get these weird, and there were, and, and a bunch of these articles, you know, gave you a scenario where, uh, in a in a town or in a in a small community, you can figure out who was positive, <laughs> right? Like you can just wait a minute. Like yesterday, the only place I went to was that bar, and the only person in the bar was the bartender, and blah blah blah. Like you know this kind of thing. Like the 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 power of uh, gossip and deductive reasoning to overcome anonymity to then that then sacrifices privacy becomes an issue and uh so so that, that's my only point between this sort of line between anonymity and privacy so it sounds good but it, but it could be and then and then of course people are being discriminated against on that basis right they're they're uh they're being shunned or they're losing their job or they're uh you know particularly in other locations around the around the world it's, it, it can be a dangerous it can be a slippery slope and Most when of us you say crazy. it can be a slippery slope, you mean the like having anonymity or the lack of anonymity? Which one is the slippery? Or they're all slippery it's slopes. Not a, which it's one not are you referring like, to? It's not unlike what you were saying about having a like using Firefox or having a Tor browser and thinking that you're fully protected. Like we believe when when we hear about this alliance, we believe that your data being anonymous and your anonymity gives you privacy, but that's not always the case. Like sometimes it's, sometimes it would be true. Uh, in other times people talk, people gossip, people deduce, and they can figure out, you know, who, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you get weird scenarios where 
a, a bartender loses their job because the app said that they were positive and they didn't tell their boss and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, all sorts of odd scenarios. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, this makes me think of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of the resources I mentioned earlier. They have a really easy to follow kind of like five question, five step questionnaire, how to set up a security plan. And it sounds really intense, like, ugh, I don't want to deal with a security plan. I already have a hard enough time doing my taxes. But it's actually really easy. And what it helps you think through is like, what is your threat model? So who would want to steal my information and why would they want to? And like, it, it helps you think through kind of like what exactly your appetite for privacy is or your needs for privacy are. Um, privacy is like the Joni Mitchell song uh, that goes, you don't know what you got until it's gone. Like you don't know how badly you need privacy until you're in a situation where you don't have it. Um, and that's why it makes it a very, uh, interesting behavioral and societal product to think about, but it, it's from a classic kind of like business marketing perspective, it's very hard because you can't really measure like somebody's willingness to pay for this. Um, I think most people would say like, I don't really care about privacy until they, they really do. Uh, there's a couple of people who are saying, um, I, I will say, uh, is another really great friend, excellent woman in blockchain. Um, she brought up the point of genetic data, which I think is, is huge. Um, so she says, one of my main concerns is in privacy is genetic information, such as Ancestry.com or 23andMe. And I think uh, Dulce didn't bring this up, but something that happens around privacy, Roy was kind of alluding to it earlier, is if my mom and my dad um, do 23andMe, then my genetic makeup is already, uh, if I can be connected as their daughter, my genetic makeup without my consent is already uh, in a service that I didn't necessarily sign up for. Um, much like if you uh, upload a video on Facebook or a picture on Facebook at a concert and you didn't ask me, uh, for my consent for that image to be uploaded. Now my face is in a facial recognition database that I couldn't really control. Um, so yeah, th this stuff can get really sci-fi really quickly. Um, something like zero knowledge proofs. Uh, it's the technology or the encryption behind um, Zcash. It's a fascinating thing to think about. Also something like, um, and I'll, I'll explain why in a little bit, what um, Monty works on at SIA. Um, there are companies who are building privacy preserving alternatives. And it's really incredible and inspiring that mathematicians, engineers, um, designers are putting so much effort behind doing this. But um, it really is an uphill battle because the entrenched market mainstays uh, have kind of trained everyone to be really comfortable with a world without privacy. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll kind of hand it back to, to the hosts. I want to say thank you again. This has been such a fun conversation. And I'm, uh, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or I'm happy to share my email with the group afterwards. Perfect. That's yeah, I really, you know, the the statement that you made about people don't care about privacy till they lose it is very true. And I think education and conversations like we had today are really helpful in making people think about this before they reach that stage. So really appreciate having you here. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. Super exciting for our first online meetup. We'll continue doing more of these. Um, same as Women Who Code, so keep checking their website, our meetup page for additional uh, resources and additional meetups. MS wants to unmute, okay. Do you, do you wanna take an, uh, one last question before we sign off? Alina? Yes, that works. 
Uh, Monty, I, you know me. I could, you don't have to <laughs> ask twice. I'm happy to talk. Okay, so MS, um, sorry, we were trying to unmute you before. We weren't able to, but now we did. So if you want to speak up. Um, okay. Hi. Um, so uh, the, uh, first of all, I'm sorry it didn't quite all came out in English, but I posted a private DNA test on a blockchain in a chat. I don't know if you can see it. I hope mm -hmm. I can. Um, George Church Genetic. Yes. That one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so, and that would be private. Um, the real question that I was going to ask you is, it doesn't seem to be, even by looking at the private transactions on a Zcash versus public transactions, it doesn't seem to be enough appetite in uh, humanity mm -hmm. for being willing to pay uh, for privacy. I love this question, MS. I am so happy you brought it up. It's something that we think about all the time. And I just so happen to have a perfect quote. Um, so there's a, so the question is, um, can I paraphrase that, like, do people want privacy at all? Um, is this a, a, a thing that people care about or that they're, they're asking um, for? And uh, right in the chat, if I, if I misrepresent their question. So there's this um, researcher, his name is, I think, Angelo Aguiletti, but he, he did a really good TED talk on kind of surveillance capitalism and, um, and gathering information and, and kind of the, the fall of privacy a few years ago. And his quote is, when someone tells you that people don't care about privacy, consider whether the game has been rigged so they cannot care about privacy. And um, I think that we have to remember how fast technology has evolved. Facebook was invented in 2006. Um, before Facebook, it would have, I remember my teachers were horrified that people would post a picture online and now it's very normal. Um, Uber was also a company that came about around that time. And um, when people first started using it, it was outlandish that you would get in a car with a stranger that you met on the internet. So I think what I'm trying to say is that behaviors can change. There just needs to be enough of an incentive um, from a market perspective, like to build sustainable products to do this and also from a regulatory perspective so we need to have laws that protect us better otherwise there will never be a financial incentive um, for somebody like google or facebook to uh, completely upend their business model however with laws like gdpr and um, in california the ccpa the consumer california consumer protection act we're starting to see a shift in that appetite. So um, I love the question. I think it comes up all the time. Uh, and, and I think it's a myth that these uh, behaviors or these preferences are static. Like we are incredibly, if COVID has taught us anything is that we're incredibly adaptive um, and resourceful and it, like ingenious people. So if we challenge ourselves to raise the bar and, and give more protections, uh, privacy protections in these products, I think we can achieve it. Um, so are people willing to pay for privacy? Uh, I, I think people are willing to pay for delightful, quality, reliable services. And as people find that services that don't protect their privacy make it hard for them to get a loan, make it hard for them to um, you know, hide their information from an algorithm when they want to, I think people will begin to, to have a stronger appetite for privacy. But today, there's just so many apps um, that uh, offer customers benefits and the exchange is um, for them to give up all of their information. So I think that will change. It doesn't change on its own. Um, it certainly needs a concerted effort of people to be more mindful about privacy. But said another way, like, you know, people would pay for cigarettes and wouldn't quit cigarettes until the government made it uh, clear that cigarettes were connected to cancer. 
Um, so, and like people will pay for junk food more than salads until they have an incentive to be healthier um, and make better choices. Uh, she said, how are you sure if Zuko heard you talking about more laws, wouldn't you be fired? Um, I'm sure he'd have opinions about it. We definitely have fun uh, debating different perspectives in this space. Um, but yeah, maybe come like at us on Twitter for sure. And Zuko is Zuko is the head of um, electric coin company, my company, and he is quite a Twitter personality. So MS, thank you for your questions. And yeah, I'm sure if you asked him, he'd have a much different perspective than the one I just shared. Awesome. I think uh, that's all the questions we had. So that's a great note to end today's meetup. Again, thank you, Elena, for coming and you know sharing your experience and your perspective on privacy. And I also want to thank Women Who Code Boston for co-hosting this meetup with us. Um, to you, Indira, want to say something? A last few words. Um, I think this was a great event. Uh, great job, Elena. I think we all learned so much. Um, and thank you all for coming. Hope to see you more at our events. Yeah, we'll see you at our next one. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. I will post uh, more information about Elena. She's already posted her docs on the Meetup group. Uh, I'll post her contact info, Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. So you can reach out to her if you have more questions, if you want to keep chatting about privacy. Thank you all for joining. Have a good night. Have a good night. Stay safe.